2021 has been a historic year for gun violence prevention. God willing, in the coming days, Congress will pass a bill that will provide up to $5 billion for community violence intervention. This would never be possible without the Fund Peace Coalition. It is a partnership with practitioners, trainers, advocates, researchers, and I'm proud to be here with a group of them today. And we're gonna talk a little bit about the process that got us to this point. So um, thank you for being here, everyone. I wanna start with uh, Marcus. What in this process <coughs> has been most inspiring or given you most hope about this work? Well, what's given me most hope is the fact that we're starting to see investments come to the ground or, or be allocated towards violence prevention. It makes me think like all the years I've been doing the work where it was a point in Chicago where we were just happy to get $6 million from the state and for the governor just recently for the ARP dollars based off of some of the fun piece movement we did when we were in Chicago, 250 million has been allocated. So that gives me tremendous hope. That's amazing. And how long have you been doing this work, Marcus? Going on about 19 years now. So mm -hmm. for me, it's just surreal to see the level of investment that potentially is about to hit the ground for those doing the work. Yeah, it is amazing. Shani, you, you are our researcher, been a huge help to the coalition. What for you has been inspiring or hopeful about this process? The most hopeful pieces of this process have been seeing the change that's happening on multiple levels. Marcus mentioned the investments mm -hmm. at the ground level, but there's conversations around investments in equity and research and conversations around investments in capacity building for organizations so that they can not only continue to do fantastic work, but also scale up and be able to manage projects and really think long term about how to create public safety in a different way than the way that we've been thinking about public safety for a very long time. Absolutely, absolutely. And Chico, you're also a veteran, violence interrupter, trainer. You've been at this a long time. What's been special about this year uh, versus all the other years that, that you've been working on this? The paradigm shift. Um, the narrative has finally changed and people doing this work are finally being respected as public health professionals who complement um, the strategy and the work that law enforcement does. And we have a narrow lane that we're able to reach, that hard to reach population that no one else could reach and change their lives. And, the last, and, and in addition to that, the way people light up when they see us and we able to now finally bring good tidings about money finally coming to ground so they can continue the great work they're doing in their communities. And coming from Chicago, I mean, you, you've been dealing with this for a long time. You've had many friends and family members impacted by this. Talk about what an influx of resources, what would that mean? In Chicago, there are so many social determinants of health that sit at the foundation of the root causes of violence that we need an abundance of resources to connect individuals to different services and networks to combat the daily trauma they face. And I believe once we begin to deconstruct those processes and deal with those issues, mm -hmm. then we can teach individuals alternatives to dealing with conflict. And, and Marcus, so as we're thinking, so God willing, we'll, we'll get this money, and already a lot of money is in, in the field, right? We've been doing a lot of advocacy, yep. uh, both you and Chico. How many, how many cities did, did you all visit the, this Six, summer? We did 16, 16 cities 16. nonstop. So that means we started in May, mm -hmm. and we were gone from our homes from May all the way to September 1st. Every week we were in a different city, but obviously it was for a great cause. And every city you would come to, get press involved, bring people to the table, and get people to realize what was going on and the resources that were needed. You know, and your fun piece, t-shirts, getting the word out. Um, and so as you think about all of that, um, and this is a great momentum we've built, what's, what is it gonna take over the next 10 years to really bring peace to our cities? Well, I think the first part was getting the resources, having some investment in the work, but I think to continue and have sustainability, it's gonna take a lot of intensive training. It's gonna take a lot, a lot of education because now with this being, obviously we know now that this is out there, everyone is clawing at the bit and all of a sudden they wanna be CVI implementers. And you know, I'm big on that. I, it's people coming out the woodworks now that money's available. So 
we, we need to make sure the practitioners are fully trained, they understand what this is about, and not just receive money and just do anything, because mm -hmm. then that, that sets us back. We're trying to get this thing going forward continually. Right, right. And one of the things, it's, it's politics, right, in terms of getting funds for this, and all of us who've done organizing work, it's a battle with cities. People want to put it in the, in the police, or they want to do whatever it is. Shawnee, from your perspective, having studied this for a, for a long time, what do people need to understand about investing in community violence intervention versus just putting all the money in police and saying that they're going to solve all the problems? Well, public safety is more than just police. Public safety is about health and well-being of communities. It's not just the absence of violence, it's the presence of all of the important things that keep communities safe. Yeah. And so these investments are focused on, you know, narrowly on violence, and they should be, and we need to be talking about healing um, and, and really helping communities heal from the inside out mm -hmm. and really investing in the people in the communities who have been doing the healing work and lifting them up. And when we do that and we invest in the whole community, mm -hmm. then we will truly see safety. And I think people are starting to realize that. Yeah, that's, that's great. Chico, talk a little bit about the personal transformations you've seen. You, you've worked with so many people on the ground. Talk about what that transformation looks like from violence to nonviolence and, and, and what that requires. I think when you think about it, the first person that transforms are the people that do the work because we work with people with lived experience. And I think the ability to meet a person where they are and for them to see you and know that you walk down a similar path, mm -hmm. it gives them a semblance of hope. And I think that's at the embryonic phase. They need hope that they can change, that their condition can change, and that there's opportunity if they do change. Mm -hmm. The process starts with engaging, just engaging and, um, and treating them like people. I think one of the things that I love about Live Free in particular is the biblical essence of love. And that's, that's what's really lacking in our communities. So when we see these individuals, we don't demonize them or label them as society. We don't even call them high risk. Mm -hmm. We call them individuals that's going through trauma because we understand what it's like to live in a community where there's gunshots every day. And we walk them through this process and we ask them what do they need by doing a needs assessment and by meeting these individuals' needs, we help them go through this process of recovery by holding their hand throughout the internal entire journey. Absolutely. And I, and I was going to ask you, Marcus, so when we're talking about individual transformation, and, and Chico says it starts with the practitioner, talk a little bit about your story and what brought you to, to Yeah, work. so I'm big on that, what Dr. Tim mentioned about, you know, I used to always, when I do my trainings, I would tell your first participant is the person right next to you when we were training VIs and outreach workers, because, you know, I'm big on what this work did for me and others, and, and I'm blessed to be able to go to these different cities and see that transformation. I think about, you know, rest in peace to my brother Dante Barksdale in Baltimore or Avon Barksdale. You know, these were individuals that changed their lives to do this work and unfortunately passed away and gone now. But I think for me, you know, I was telling the brother just outside now that this work changed my life. 18 years, I come out of incarceration after doing 10 years, never thought in the world that I'd be doing no social work, fun, peace, live free, none of that. That was not in my agenda. I wanted to, like Biggie say, sell crack rock, I have a wicked jump shot. That's exactly what I thought my life was going to be, even when I came out of prison. But for this work to come, come to me, it saved me first. I love that we save saving people on the streets with the implementation of CVI work, but truly it saves the staff. And that's why I say to people, when you invest in this work, you're not just investing in stopping violence. You're investing on a workforce that can do more than just work at McDonald's because we come out the joint and we have a, re a, a record. I mean, this work has taken me to Africa, Israel. I've been with South African delegations. I've been with mayors, governors. I'm, I'm formerly incarcerated. And look, and I don't have no PhD, and I love education. Shout out to my <laughs> doctors and stuff next to me. But th the work did that for me and put me in places that I never thought that I would be sitting at those tables. The transformation is real in this work. Absolutely. So, Dr. Bugs, Dr. Tillman, speaking of doctors, so, so Shani, we've been very intentional about this effort requiring multiple types of expertise, right? So there's folks who, who know how to do the intervention on the ground, folks who know how to build organizations, folks who know how to advocate and organize and, and research as well. So um, from, from your perspective, 
what are, what are the different pieces that you feel like need to be developed at this point, talk about scaling up this work, to really make sure there's quality uh, strategies going on in all these different cities? We continue to learn as a research community about what violence is and how it's healed. Mm -hmm. And we need to continue that. We also need to do far more in conjunction with organizations to understand what individuals who are doing the work see as change. Mm -hmm. We're not currently measuring all of the ways mm -hmm. that individuals transform. And we need to be showing that. We need to be tracking that so that mm -hmm. we can identify where it's going well, when we can see it and measure it, mm -hmm. and when we need to make some, some changes and some adjustments. And researchers have to work in conjunction with the organizations and the experts who are doing the work on the ground so that we can collectively come up with the right kinds of measures and the right kinds of ways to identify what success really looks like. Yeah, that's great. So, uh, Chico, this has been a, quite a journey this year. All of us, we, we all from different organizations, all doing different stuff, and we've banded together in a way, to me, has been really beautiful. Yeah. Right, and I think it's been a selfless effort to really just figure out how do we get more resources for folks who need it. Talk a little bit about what that's been like just working with now this, we got over 150 people, 150 organizations signed on to the coalition. What has that been like? I'll tell you, um, at first, um, it, was a, it was a challenge. It was a challenge because you, you put a group of leaders in a space and we all had different ideas but the beauty of it was we all had a desire to see our people get better and see our people stop dying each and every day. I believe for us, two things were real monumental. The first one was, um, I believe when we got um, the conversation with um, Susan Rice mm -hmm. and we pitched the $5 billion and, um, other groups, I'm not going to say no name, was pitching different numbers, right. and she was blown away by our intellect. And I want to say this, um, man, it's a blessing to be around some of the most brilliant minds on this planet in the space of violence prevention. I wake up every day saying I'm blessed just to be able to work with the individuals I work with. And it was a testament when we wrote in three days um, about a 40 or 50 page document, it was accepted by the White House. And the second time that I was really blown away was when we got the call, I think it was around 11 at night, and they say the president has adopted what y'all said into the Build Back Better mm -hmm. bill. I, tears came down my eyes because even though we worked and we believed just to see it actualized, um, really just took my breath away. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we elbowed our way into the meeting to get the meeting in the first place. We put together the proposal. No one had ever heard of five billion being put on the table and everybody kind of went back like this. But as you said, we did our homework and we made the case for why that was necessary. And we were relentless with Congress, with the press, five billion, five billion, five billion. And, you know, and, and now we're here hopefully getting close to that place. But what you mentioned about black and brown folks advocating for themselves, right? We didn't follow somebody else's lead about what was needed. We said what was needed. Right, and so Marcus, as, as, as you all been going to these different cities, what are you hearing from folks when, you, when, you're, when you're coming and, and talking about funding peace and, and the effort to really bring resources to them? What, what are they saying? Well, first, they were very receptive, and, and I want to give a shout out to some of the Live Free Federations that joined us in different cities, in Birmingham and in Chicago and, and various places that we went. Um, but the reception was, you know, was very welcoming, and it was. It was, a, I mean, they were just ready to receive resources. I mean, we went to some places where the staff didn't even have insurance, right? And how are you gonna do this work and you don't have no benefits, you don't have anything, and, and no resources, no wraparound. And so they were all excited about the potential of this money coming to the ground. And uh, me and Dr. Tillman and the Fund Peace team are, right now we're organizing follow-ups because it's one thing for somebody to commit and say, hey, we're gonna give this money, mm -hmm. but we wanna go back and make sure. I mean, Dr. Mm -hmm. Tillman used to always say, we sat down, and one of them cities with the mayor, he said, look, listen, this can either be celebratory 
or this can be, you know, we're going to be going back and forth. So how do you want it? Because we are having this press conference tomorrow, whether like it or not. Right. And we had people tell us in cities, well, we only have this amount of million. You guys are crazy to ask for that. Mm -hmm. One city, we left two weeks later, they got 10 times more than what was said by the city that they only had. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think it just a lot of hope was expressed mm -hmm. when we met different people, they were excited. And, and not only did we come and, and advocate for funding, the Fund Peace Committee, we left a token of love to every city that we went to. Just to show, it might not have been millions or whatever, but we gave a token to the groups that were on the ground and say, hey, here's something to show that we care. And now let's see your mayors and your governors and your county care and do the same thing. Absolutely. So on a previous panel, I was saying, you know, we'll know we're on the right track when community violence intervention becomes a household term, right? So right now, you know, when mass shootings happen, everyone starts talking about background checks, assault weapons, you know, bans. So everyone knows, runs to that place. It, it's, it's muscle memory. Ultimately, we got to get to a place where people say, we need community violence intervention. And it's on the lips of everybody uh, in the community so that there's real pressure around it. So, and part of what we realized is people just don't know. That's that right. That they're proven evidence-based ways of reducing violence. So, Shani, what do you want people to know about what community violence intervention is or how would we describe it to folks so they understand what we're talking about? <laughs> <laughs> Tough one. Uh, tough Encapsulate one, right. it all. Right. Um, you know, community violence intervention is about an approach that utilizes the expertise of individu individuals from the community who have the knowledge of what it takes to transform and empowering those individuals with the right resources, with the right supports for the staff, for the people doing the work, wrapping them in love, loving on the community. And there are a number of different models that exist, different approaches, but it really is about investing in the people in the community and really humanizing the individuals as Chica was talking about, recognizing that th these are people who have dealt with trauma on trauma on trauma. And how do we walk with them? How do we build them up in ways that meet their needs, in ways that recognize that transformation is a process, but really engaging with people in ways that we have not before, recognizing that we cannot continue to ignore the expertise of the people who have lived the life, who understand what transformation looks like and what it takes to get there, and really investing in resources and in the building up of the organizations and the communities that have been heroically muscling through this for yep. decades. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, it's remarkable what's been achieved just in this, in this short year, in addition to the potential five billion we're waiting for, the White House proposed over $200 million for next year's fiscal budget, 26 federal grants are now eligible for CVI work. Um, and I think there's just wider recognition. It's starting to become a little bit of a, of a, of a household name. And for me personally, just working with you all and the rest of, of the partners of this has been so refreshing because you know, I, to, I told Mike at a certain point, we, we're gonna have to figure out a different strategy because <laughs> you know, this is tiring work. <laughs> and so to be with you all has been a privilege and an honor and uh, can't wait to do 10 more years with you all. So thank you for being with us. Thank Thanks you. Thanks so much for Thank all you, you do. Thank you.